welcome to the From Survivor to Thriver podcast. I'm Mark Fernandes. Each week, along with my co-host Eric DeRosa, we aim to shatter the stigma around mental health conversations through kitchen table conversations with real and relatable people. All the while, reminding our audience that they are not alone. There is hope, there is help, and there is a way through. Enjoy today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to From Survivor to Thriver, episode 164. This is Mark Fernandes sitting in his usual seat across the creek from his ever committed to destroying himself. I usually try to use one word, but knowing what you did to yourself over the past week, and I hope you're feeling better, Eric DeRosa, how are we today? Feeling better. Back is feeling better. I'm glad to. <laughs> yeah, it's not 100%, and I'll be back at the chiropractor tomorrow. But yes, I'm I didn't want to like describe you as like injured or like no, because you do it to yourself. Not injured. So I, and I was trying to come up with right, and I was trying to come up with a single word. I, I guess self-flagellating might have worked. Overzealous. <laughs> no, this this time of year. Oh, I was, okay, overzealous. I was overzealous. I was excited, too excited for Mountain Bike season, say. and, it's one and way. cut off, bit off a lot more than I could chew. But I'm feeling better, and if I had to, I could get on the bike and ride. So I'm it's, it's so glad more, to hear that because I know more, that's not more how annoying. you were a couple days ago. No, no, <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't walk. I actually couldn't walk a couple of days ago, but yes, feeling much, much better. How are you? I'm excellent. It's been, it's been a wild week, but really good and feeling really good, really happy. This is a tough time of the year for me. And I feel like I'm so far, it's early, but I feel like I'm doing better than usual. Although I really did want to go skiing this morning and I almost went for a skin, but then I had to like figure out a car shuttle and ding, 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 because I'm not dealing with the bottom of the mountain. So that's where I'm at. Excellent. Well, let's go meet our guest because I was honored let's. to have been on her show just a couple of weeks ago. Joining us today is Julie Rose. She has been a radio journalist for 20 years reporting for NPR local stations and network shows like Morning Edition and All Things Considered. In 2015, she began hosting a nationally syndicated live interview show on Sirius XM 143 called Top of Mind. But after several years on the air every day, she began fighting the urge to avoid the news completely because of how anxious and angry it made her feel. She knew she couldn't be alone in that. So in 2022, a new format for Top of Mind became the answer. Now a weekly podcast, the show tackles tough topics in a way that's honest and probing, but also leaves people feeling empathetic and empowered. Julie has since become an advocate for bridging divides in public discourse, something needed more now than ever before because news avoidance and polarized information sources are a serious problem. She feels strongly that we can't just avoid the news and expect to build the communities we want to live in. Julie has received a Gracie Award and multiple Edward R. Murrow Awards for her work in her field. With that, let's go across the border to Utah to welcome in today's guest. Hi, Julie. How are you? I am great, Eric, Mark. Hello. And I'm so glad you're no longer laid up. That's a little scary that you... Oh my gosh, so much damage to yourself so, riding a bike. <laughs> just 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 to clarify this. Yeah, yeah. He and I both love like adrenaline and adventure sports. <laughs> so for both of us to be sitting here like completely healthy would be almost zero percent. I'm okay. going to see my acupuncturist on Wednesday. It's it, it we, right. our mental health and our physical health is a cost of battle and we're very comfortable with that. Yeah, yeah. The riskiest <laughs> the riskiest thing I, I do is I walk on my treadmill and I put it up really steep so I can walk kind of slowly and I knit while I walk. So I don't think you would count that as like high adventure adrenaline, but there is a little I, bit of danger involved with the knitting needles. <laughs> so I generally try it. not to carry sharp things while doing something else. There, there's actually, a, I'm forgetting the guy's name, but there's a great book about mental health called Running with Scissors. Oh, yeah, shit, Bo, Bill Bryson, name? I think he wrote. That Bill, sounds right. Bill, Bill Bryson. That sounds right. Maybe. And although hearing the, <laughs> hearing the, the true angle, which is what? all the way up is pretty steep. 
and the knitting, yeah. I would actually be more prone to getting hurt doing that <laughs> than I would riding a mountain bike or <laughs> yes. Augustine Burroughs. Oh, Augustine Burroughs. That's Burroughs. who it is. Yeah, yeah. You're right. And it's a fantastic book. Yeah, you know, there is a little bit of danger involved, but I go very, very slowly. So, <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for the kind words. Skilled. And yes, I am feeling better. <laughs> pretty, yeah, I'm knit one well. pearl, two step, step. Knit there one you go. Two, I'm, I'm actually, I've got a great mental image of it. Mm. Hearing, hearing your bio and reflecting on our pre-show call, like, yeah, feel free to drive the bus. We're amateurs, but I just want to hear about the realizations of that intersection when you realize that people could get the news packaged in a way that didn't necessarily push to anxiety. Eric and I have yeah. been very open about what's going on with the Israeli conflict and how much that pushes on both of us for different reasons. But part of it, I've noticed, like, I generally try to read my news or like little snapshots and then kind of like back away from it because all of it is intent on keeping you like hyper-focused. And, yeah. and especially for someone like me with ADHD, that's the last thing I need. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so for me, part of one of the big drivers of kind of this professional crisis that I experienced is that I have had anxiety for my whole entire life, but have been taking medication since I was in my early 20s. And I'll just say that I think, I think the medication helps, but also it, it doesn't it doesn't fix it. <laughs> as anyone who takes medicine knows. And so I have had a real, like, I, I really struggle to sort of keep, keep the anxiety from driving the, 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 the car most of the time in my life. And one of the things that I, I have come to realize is that it's really rooted in this fear of n not being in control of things, being unable to guarantee an outcome is when my anxiety really starts to spiral. And so as I started to, over the last number of years, recognize that it, that my, that my job and my news consumption were like really like my really making things worse for me. I, I was, I got to a place actually in about 2018 where I just couldn't, I mean, I have a, I have a great job hosting a daily live radio show and talking to people and learning lots of interesting things. And I mean, it's like my dream in a lot of ways. And yet I was completely at the end of my rope, like could not, I was so irritable and angry and constantly anxious and never felt satisfied or content. And I'm like, well, I don't want to just keep upping my medication and what else, what else is there? And I'm, I tried therapy and it just didn't feel like just going in and talking about my, my anxiety didn't make it any better. Like somebody <laughs> give me a tool. Right. And I finally ended up kind of out of desperation, which is silly because it's not a desperate thing to do, but I, tr I, I signed up for a mindfulness course for an eight week mindfulness-based stress reduction. So MBSR. John Kabat-Zinn is the guy who kind of created it. And he's a neuroscientist and also a Zen Buddhist. And so it's a really interesting, but very practical course for like eight weeks. We go a couple of times a night for several hours and sit on bolsters and like breathe <laughs> and, and learn and just like practice as a group doing various different kinds of meditation and mindful movement and learning the concepts behind mindfulness. And the thing that, and this all dovetails into sort of how I was able to find an answer to the news avoidance thing for me was that I, I realized in this course, and mind you, this was 2018. So I was already, I mean, into my forties at this point, right? I'm a full grown adult. <laughs> it, it, that was the very first time that I actually realized that if I acknowledged my feelings, if I acknowledged the anxiety and the it, whatever, all the negative stuff that I was feeling that I, that I could sort of acknowledge it and feel it and that it would actually pass. It, I, I had spent my entire life trying to corral it and control it and push it back. The fear, the anger, the sadness, all the negative emotions, right? Like spent so much time trying to corral these intrusive worries and tie them up and keep them, keep me safe from them. And this mindfulness course, I'll never forget the day that we sat down there. It was early on. I was like super skeptical. I'm a real cynic and definitely like a well, but kind of question asker. And, and, and I just had this monkey mind, like they were talking about things were just going, going, going in my head. And I could hardly even bear it for two minutes to sit quietly, constantly fidgeting and like, ah, oh, this is making me crazy. And so I, I asked the, our guide, I'm like, what am I supposed to do with it? Like, I can't quiet this. And he's like, no, 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 you don't have to quiet it. 
and you don't have to control it because I was trying to like keep it at bay. And mm -hmm. he's like, just picture yourself sitting on the edge of a, of a, of a rushing river or a stream, whatever is going by. All of those thoughts are, are the, are they flowing past you? You're safe and you're comfortable and you're watching them. You might even get a little curious about them. Oh, look at that. Hmm, I'm really feeling anxious right now. Hmm, I'm really, that's really making my heart race in this way. Or look at, and, and to like be aware of them, nod to them and just allow them to keep on flowing. And lo and behold, they passed. I, I did not know that they would not simply take me with them right over the, right over the cliff into the abyss. Like I really, really, really thought that if I felt them and allowed and acknowledged them, that they would suck me down and I would be completely, I'd have no more control at all. So the, I mean, now in hindsight, I'm like, why didn't somebody ever teach me this before? How, how did it take me that long to realize that all my efforts to control it and fight it were only making things worse? So with this new knowledge that I had, I started recognizing that a lot of the anxiety that I was feeling around the fast forwarding a couple of years into around 2021, I was doing this daily news show. I mean, I'd done more than 10,000 interviews. We were talking about all the things going on in the world. And I was so anxious all the time and really just like not wanting to have to absorb or, or consume any of that news, but also feeling really embarrassed about it because I'm a journalist. What am I going to do if I don't want to do the news anymore? <laughs> so... <laughs> It was like, I, I mean, I, first of all, I can't admit this. Second of all, does it mean I'm going to have to change my job? So that was just making things even more worse. Right. And I came across one day as I'm scanning the headlines for work, kind of just like gritting my teeth to get through it till I could go home and listen to music and sort of try to ignore it for another 24, 12 hours till I had to go back to the office. I came across an article. It was an op-ed written by a woman named Amanda Ripley, who was also a news journalist. She covered conflict zones. And she says, I have a secret. I kept it hidden for longer than I care to admit. It felt unprofessional, vaguely shameful. It wasn't who I wanted to be, but here it is. I have been actively avoiding the news for years. So she's publicly acknowledging this. And that had the effect of me re of, of relieving some of the guilt and shame, because if she could do it in the Washington Post, then I could acknowledge that it was real and was, that I could also yeah. find out that it, that it wasn't just me and that there, there, it turns out I learned in that moment that there are 40% of Americans who are actively avoiding the news because of a lot of the same reasons that I had just described. Well, first of all, Julie, thank you so much for sharing that. And I know you and I've had some discussions on your show as well. And it takes a lot of courage, as you had said, to be able to say that publicly, right? When, when that is what your job is. And yeah. so kudos to you. And, and as you were talking about that, I started to think and reflect back to, you know, when I was in my high school years, college years, and then into my early work years, when news in many ways was different than it is today, right? We didn't even have, there was no serious XM. It was, mm -hmm. I think in, in our house, we watched Peter Jennings and that was the evening news that I watched. I would watch the local news. And then as I got a bit older, it was a combination of the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times every day. And I could kind of pick and choose. And a lot of it then became uh, related to what I did on a day to day basis. Mm -hmm. I also found that I would need to avoid specific topics or specific stories yeah. suffering from severe anxiety, as do you, because I would take those stories on. I couldn't just read them and acknowledge it was a story. And suddenly, whatever that story had, I now had it. And the intrusive thoughts would start. Was that a similar thing mm -hmm. for you? And would you go through these long periods of time where you would now convince yourself that you were what that story was? Yeah, for me, I think it was more that I felt like I was part of the problem. So I had I had both feeling like it's hopeless. The, for, the, the big thing was there's I, there's so much here that I can't control. The only way that I'm ever able to control my anxiety is if I feel like I can control something. <laughs> I need to be able to feel some sense of control. And when I was consuming the news, it just felt like it was coming from all angles. And I couldn't I couldn't fix any of it. 
And on top of that, I felt like I was I was only making it worse for the rest of the world <laughs> by being one of the journalists who was talking about it. Like I was both suffering from it and perpetuating it simultaneously. And then I was like, well, what's the point of my life then? Like, what am I doing on a daily basis? If I'm if I'm like avoiding the news and at the same time I'm putting it out there, what is my purpose here? And so I think I think for me it was especially, and then when it came down to like specifically what I was avoiding, it was that it felt it felt hopeless. It felt like all there was was conflict and failure and corruption in the world. And I also didn't want to just read stories about puppies and rainbows because that didn't feel like the real world. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so it made me think like the real world. I just, I felt like there's no good news out there. And, and it, 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 it started to feel so, I constantly felt like I was being told how I should think about things or that the way I thought about it was either totally right or totally wrong. It just felt very, very polarizing and very kind of without any nuance, which I started to realize was n not the way for me to feel empowered. So so especially I think it was that, Eric. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. It makes a ton of sense. <laughs> it makes yeah. a ton of sense. And I think what you speak to is like an acute sort of micro look at a macro problem, right? Yeah. If you're looking at news as it's presented nowadays, it's really about getting clicks and selling commercials. It's not necessarily yes. about showing a fair, balanced, invested, thought provoking, like one of my favorite news shows, and I still watch it. I actually DVR it because I don't want to get up early on Sunday morning, but I love the CBS show Sunday morning mm -hmm. because it takes vastly different subjects, all these different things, and it just reports. And mm -hmm. that I think I'm about to be 48. So that's the news I remember as a kid. Like you would turn on the midday or the nightly news and you got news. You didn't get this like sensationalized version. And it sounds to me from the outside looking at it, there was a piece of you that just wanted that. <laughs> and, and, and the other bit of it that I think, and this just kind of occurred to me is we be, it's become such a fast, people talk about the 24 hour news cycle versus what is it now? Like seven seconds? Like, I don't even know if anyone's yeah. tried to. <laughs> and yeah. it's too it's too much a lot of the times if you're consuming it that way. And so I, I can't even imagine that feeling of falseness or hypocrisy, like whatever word you would want to use for it, that mm. you would feel of like, I'm perpetuating the thing that's making me crazy. What am I doing? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And, and so for me, I mean, it was, it's sort of this dual lens that was key to the shift from survivor to thriver, if I can use those words. Right. So like, yes. I'm just hanging on by my fingernails and, um, totally anxious and sort of like burying my head in the sand as often as I possibly can. And kind of just trying to ignore looking too deeply at this part because I, I like, it's part of my, my job identity. Right. So so for me, it was recognizing, okay, so there's two things at play here. There is that there are aspects of the way the news is done that is fueling this for a lot of people and that it's not just me. And so on the one hand, could, could I do the news differently? Could our show do the news differently? And what would that mean? And then there was also the parallel of I'm also a news consumer and could I consume differently? And it turns out that actually both of those things were informed by the mindfulness training that I got <laughs> and and sort of as I as I started to kind of move forward through these things. I mean, that's how the, the, the podcast came to be. It was right around that same time that I was given the chance to say, all right, we'll stop doing the daily news thing. Let's let's figure out how to make a weekly podcast. What would you do? What would you want to get from the news that, that wouldn't make you feel these things that wouldn't be overwhelming, polarizing? depressing and shallow. What, what would you want instead? And so it's been a journey over the last couple of years figuring out, all right, well, this is, this is what I would like from my news and, and try to put that out there for other people. And then at the same time, this is what, this is what I can control in my news consumption and get to a place now where, and I'm happy to share some of the things that I've learned, but they're really mm -hmm. simple little hacks that have really helped me to, now I don't have to avoid the news. I just consume it mindfully. And, and I do it with intention. I was curious. So as you were, as you were talking about that, the way you consume it and the way that you present it, mm -hmm. have you found that they're very similar 
or that you have one specific way that you can, that you consume it. And then you figured out a different way to be able to present it so that people get all of the information, not in, but it's in a, it's in a way that you want them to hear it. Well, and it's interesting, Eric, I gave you the table there because I figured we were going to ask the same question. I'm going to add one more layer to it. Okay. So in looking at it that way, when you first started to do it, were you just thinking about how you would consume it and whether or not that would drive anxiety for you? Or were you able to kind of pull up to that 30,000 foot view and be like, hey, how can I present this to an audience of however many and limit limit the anxiety and up the info or however you looked at it? Yeah. So uh, there's actually quite a bit of crossover to in, in both of the things, which has been really nice. So uh, the first thing when we were kind of creating, first came creating the podcast and then came figuring out also some of my own strategies to consume the news as a, per, as a, as a consumer. So on the, in terms of like what, the first place that I started was as a team. In fact, I have a couple of other people on my team here with Top of Mind, the daily radio show. When we stepped back, the starting place was, look, there are 40% 40, 40 of Americans actively avoid the news. So let's make a podcast for them. We know this based on survey work done by Reuters International Institute. Digital News Institute, I think it's called, or Reuters Journal. No, I should have written it down. But anyway, it's a Reuters research that you can look up. And they do this for people around, for countries around the world. But what they found in surveying people in the United States, it's all the things I mentioned. Because it, it's depressing, it feels biased, it, it's overwhelming, okay? So what, and so for me, it was, it was gratifying to say, all right, well, I'm one of 40% of Americans that are either avoiding certain topics perpetually or avoiding the news entirely or avo avoiding it for stretches of time because I just can't take it. And a lot of us don't want to be in that position because it keeps us trapped in our echo chambers. It limits our ability to engage and influence on important issues. I want to be informed, but I also want to feel calm. So it would be, so, so what, did, what do I want from my news? I would like for it not to be condescending or trying to inflame my emotions or try to just yank my attention around, okay? I would like for it to feel optimistic. I don't want to feel like it's hopeless. Now, that doesn't mean that I that you show me how to solve all the world's problems, but but if there is progress being made, nod to it in the story. I, I, I want to know that progress is possible. I don't just want to read story after story after story that says the problem is terrible and everybody is failing. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. You want to talk about solutions? Why? Yes. I'm yeah, <laughs> exactly. And there is a whole, whole new genre that's, that's bubbling up in journalism that, that is called solutions journalism, which actually does make sure that as often as possible, we're thinking about that solutions lens, that we're not just ignoring that piece of it, that we're trying actively to include it when it exists. The other things, so optimistic, calm. I want surprise. I want to see the issue in new ways. I don't, for me, it, it was only just making me feel more hopeless when I would read a story where, where there, all the archetypes were there, the stereotypical conservative, whatever, and the liberal view on this. And then everything sort of played out based on these stereotypes in my mind. For me, that, that only just further cemented in my, my mind, in my heart, the sense that there are good guys and bad guys in this story and everybody kind of falls in. So I wanted complexity. I want to be surprised. I want to hear that this person who, who you think might, because of X, Y, and Z related to their political and racial and gender and whatever identities that, that you, you would think they're going to think this way, but in fact, it's more complicated than that. And, and here's how I want to feel empathetic. So I want to be exposed, not just to pundits who are giving me their hot takes, but I want to hear from people who have real, real skin in the game and who, who've who experienced, been personally affected so that I can experience empathy and I want to feel empowered. And for me, that simply means that there, I know there's a next step for me somehow. So that may not be, I want to get to the end of, a, of an episode or a story. And I want to know, I want to either feel like I know enough now that I've actually like to go have a conversation about this with somebody in my life who is affected by this. Or I know enough now to know that there's a lot I don't know. So I'm going to go do some more research on this. Or, oh, I'm going to actually look up this, the people who are on the ballot in November and see how they feel about this issue. Because now that I know what I know, this is, I actually want to look at this differently. 
All right. So, or there might be like, oh, here's a solution and I want to support that. Or, oh, here's a, here, here's an issue that I want to get involved with, right? Lots of things, but it, there's just a next step for me. I don't feel like you've just fed me this sort of like package of terribleness that has made me feel things. The end, <laughs> All right? That's not <laughs> well, empowering. <laughs> and I'm going to be awful and stereotypical here. And I'm just saying that as sort of a caveat, but when you watch the news generally, it's what you just described, right? The awfulness and terribleness, or we're rescuing kittens, or some blind person had a surgery and can see, right? It's yeah. the absolute extremes. And so essentially, they're telling you how to feel. When, when I hear you describe what you're talking about, it's like, oh, wait, so you're going to give me some information. I'm going to learn a little bit, and then I get to decide how I feel. Yeah, that's yeah. the kind of news I'd be interested in. From a purely business standpoint, when I hear you say, 40% of Americans are in some level of news avoidance. I'm like, well, that's an opportunity. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the number one thing. And the second thing is, how do you dance the balance of like fair balance reporting right. with solution oriented, but keep that not biased? That to me, I'm like, that's a tenuous. It, it is absolutely. So a couple of things to know. First of all, I don't think there's any such thing as zero bias because no matter. I 100%. Mean, Yes, because no matter how I, so for a, for an episode of Top of Mind, we aim to do all the things I just described, to leave you feeling empowered, empathetic, to provide elements of surprise, and to have it be calm and thoughtful and nuanced, all right? We're leaning into all of those things. Now, how am I going to get you to listen to that when you could spend your time scrolling headlines that are going to make you feel big feels, or you could be over on social media having all the sort of dopamine hits that come from the algorithms, right? Instant gratification. and and the fact that no, like, when was the last time, this is an honest question for the two of you, when was the last mm -hmm. time you actually read an entire news article from the first word to the last word? Like you literally we're, read the entire article. We're the wrong people to ask. I subscribe to The Economist and The Atlantic. And you do, <laughs> and you read an entire article. You do that on a regular basis. See, We're that the is, wrong people to ask. But that is very, very rare. I mean, even I, I find myself, and this will get into the consumption piece of it, but we are really programmed to kind of, take the first couple of minutes, take the first 60 seconds. Like a lot of people consume their news on social media, which is in 60 second bites <laughs> or just headlines. I find myself a lot of times getting people are like, oh, I don't really consume the news, but I know what's going on in the world. Well, the largest chunk of, of news consumers out there are passive consumers, which means we're not actually going out searching for news and consuming it intentionally, we're just letting it flow past us. So, mm -hmm. so, so part of the challenge with top of mind is to try to keep people listening when it is so easy to turn it off, turn the page, move on to the next thing in your feed. So what we, what we do back to the bias thing is try to write up it up front. I'm not going to take a side, but I've also not promising you that I'm going to give you every perspective possible under the sun, because there are, there is no such thing as just two sides to any issue. We're And so instead, what I'm going to do is we spend most of our work on these episodes. It takes us two months to put two months to put an hour long episode together, because from the beginning to the end, most of it is trying to find perspectives that are going to help us see that issue in a new light that are that are people who have real personal stake. They've been personally affected by the issue. And this is crucial. No matter what your view on that issue is. And I assume the full range is possible on any of these topics, because we're taking hot button topics every week intentionally to help people engage with these topics that maybe they're inclined to want to avoid because they think they know everything there is to know about it, or they don't have any interest in changing their mind, or it's just too, it, they don't like the way that that topic makes them feel. So we're going to take a topic like race or uh, racism or policing or criminal justice or affirmative action or immigration. We've done lots of episodes on all of those kinds of things. And no matter where you where you fall on that issue, sort of what your view is, you will hear something in that episode that will challenge you. And that's a crucial piece of the puzzle because it's it's th that thing that we are out of we're out of practice as a, as a society. It, it's part of what gets us flipping to the next thing that we're not comfortable being uncomfortable. We don't know how to sit in the presence of or hear a perspective that we disagree with and not let that turn on all of our threat responses and make us freak out. I mean, this is the mindfulness piece, right? It's yeah. for me, it was a recognition that I, 
a lot of what I was doing with my news consumption was was sort of like fighting against these the, the discomfort of, oh, I don't agree with that. And then I would like sort of fight that and kind of be uncomfortable with that. And then finally just quit and go read something else. Right. Instead of just sort of sitting in, in the presence of it with, with curiosity, huh? Look how I'm feeling about that. Go ahead. So I was just, and I'm, I'm going to come back to the word that you just finished with, but first to the question that you had asked earlier, because I am a yeah. little bit different than Mark. And it's oh, yeah. interesting. A lot of it, a lot of it was aware as I had from the time the time I got off the subway at my office in of time to be able to consume as much information as possible. And so I I became more of a skimmer where I could I would see the headlines and I would read the important pieces of the article. And even nowadays, it's, I'm not going to say it's rare, but it's not as common that I will sit down and read each and every word of an article. I find myself kind of drifting my mind kind of, and I'm like, oh, I just want to kind of get to the point of where this article is going. And then I'll sit down and I'll reflect on it. Uh, yeah. Your last word that you brought up was something I wanted to ask you about. And it is this idea of curiosity and creative thinking when it comes to conversation. And I feel as though over the, over the last couple of decades, that's really been lost. The ability to read something, the ability to hear something on the radio or watch something on TV and see it and hear it and take it in as this is a topic. And now let's go off and have a conversation around that topic. Let's be curious. Let's kind of stretch it and pull it in and ask different points of view. Why do you, why do you think that has changed so much? And we're all kind of in that similar age group. And so we've seen it change along with us. Yeah. Well, I think it's, I, I think there are a couple of things. I think, I think what you're describing is this, this sense that it, that, that we don't really know how to sort of stay curious in the face of information that we disagree with, right? Or, or when exposed to people that we disagree with. I think there are a couple of reasons why we're out of practice with that, or we never learned it in the first place, depending on how old you are or how, how, how involved you've been in this process. I think, I think the main reasons why so few of us do it today is because we simply don't have to. Because I can, there are so many sources of information and news out there that I can live in a little worldview bubble where go all, find your echo chamber. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and because there is so much news out there, if it, it's so overwhelming that I don't blame any of us for sort of picking the source that is the most comfortable, the most accessible, the most digestible for us and kind of just consuming it there. Right. So we have, we have the choice. Also, we have become as a, just as a society in the United States, we we're, we're prone as human beings to sort ourselves. That's like an innate tendency. We're to kind of create little groups, in groups, tribes, whatever word you want to call it. And to kind of cluster like-minded people and view people who are different as the other. And as a natural consequence also of of income inequality and historic uh, policies that enforced racial and religious segregation many decades ago, and we still live with the legacy of that in the United States, we are very segregated in our society. I, it's very, very rare these days. We're, we're politically segregated. I mean, all you have to do is look at like district maps and look at neighborhood maps and voting maps, and you can see like people tend to vote the same in clusters, right? Mm -hmm. And we are, I mean, I can spend a lot of my life interacting with people who look pretty much like me in my neighborhood, in my church congregation, at work. Like it's actually kind of hard work to, to, to expose myself to people who think differently. In, well, it's even easier now if you live in a community like that to live a virtual life sure. and find the echo chamber that way. Like, yeah, you don't me, even that, have to know your neighbors. You can just you like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's something we've talked about before and something I find so interesting. And, and this is just confirming I'm an even stranger human than I thought because Eric and I talked about this and he thinks I'm a little strange sometimes because if it's something I'm not that interested in, I skim and, and I'll get a decent amount of it. If it's something I am interested in, I literally flop back and forth between three different news channels I will not mention and 
will go into a point where Eric's like, what, what, why, why are you trying to like write a research paper about this subject? And I was like, mm-hmm. I just, I don't understand it. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I need to know more. And I know that that's different than a lot of people, but then I get in the situations and this is leading to my question where I'm sitting across from someone who is in that echo chamber. And I've decided somehow that I'm the one who's going to change their mind, which is idiocy. I know that. I don't need an answer there. But when you look at this from a journalism standpoint, how do you think you can, because it sounds like that's really what you're aiming at, present things in such a way that allow people that space to not feel judged, right? Because when you read something that is outside of your purview or your point of view, it's very easy to just other the shit out of it, right? How do you think you can do that? Because I'm super interested. Like our listeners know I'm not allowed to learn about you before we sit down to talk. So I can't wait to listen to your podcast now. I'm so yeah. excited. But, Top of mind um, with Julie Rose, by the way. You can find well, it. We'll do that again at the end, honey. We'll do that again at the end. Don't you and worry. something new and exciting um, coming in July. That's right. A new, <laughs> right. A new podcast need featuring to, Eric. Do we need to tease that now or tease it later? Well, well I'll roll it in in just a minute. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but so how, how do we do, do it? You, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it is, it is a challenge that we're aware with. We use, okay. So, so a lot of it has to do with the guest selection and, and then careful narration. We lean into human stories and great stories, really interesting. And we're telling a story in a way that like leaning into sort of the the, the, the cognitive dissonance and the nuance, right? Because I, wh- what I have found is that if you tell a good story, and if you find guests who have good stories to tell, and then you can tell those stories, if you can uns- unspool the story in a way that has a sense of momentum and there's a sense of, yeah, well, I never did, or I always wondered about that. Like if we can create moments of surprise, uh, because for me, a lot of the research in every single one of these episodes, I'm looking for stuff that's going to make me go, wait a second. I never thought of that before. Or, yeah, that's really outside of my life experience. I, that's kind of a blind spot to me. All right. So we're trying to make sure that we have enough of those moments that no matter who you are, you're going to have some of those experiences, which hopefully, hopefully you're not afraid of that sense of curiosity. I think curiosity is pretty innate in a lot of people. You kind of want to know more. You want to know more. You want to know more. So we try to create just as a, this is like insider baseball here, but we try to create internal, internal cliffhangers to kind of keep people listening forward and forward over the course of a 53 minute episode. And, 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 and honestly, I think a big part of it is that like, I'm, I'm upfront that I'm not trying to change your mind, but, but you but I also have confidence that that you as a listener, we can do this together. Like, I know that this is a little awkward. I know you might be hearing something that's challenging. I know this might be off-putting to you, but I'm, I'm with you here on this. And we're going to, we're, we're in this together. And I promise you, you're going to feel, and I, I mean, I don't know exactly what the magic, saw, the, the magic thing is that we do, but we are so careful and so mindful at every moment that, that this is hard work and that we're asking people to do some pretty heavy lifting here. And I will tell you that time and again, I mean, this, this shocks me. We don't have, we don't have like gazillion numbers or anything. Right. But I, every week I get an email from someone who says, you know what, you are opening my mind in ways that I haven't felt before. And I really like this feeling. Like I didn't know I was missing this of all the podcasts that I would have thought I stumbled on this one and I am really intrigued or like so I even I even get guests who are experts on these topics who I invite to come be on a show on one of these episodes. And I'm like, it's about this topic that you're an expert in. So I'm going to talk to you. And then they go and listen to the podcast and then they'll email me back and they'll be like, that was really interesting. Like you covered some stuff that I hadn't really thought about before. And I'm like, and you're the expert. So like, yay! what I want people to realize, I think fundamentally it is that I find it exhilarating. If I can stay open and curious enough to stick with the discomfort long enough to get to, to the, to the next place, which is wow, like it feels like my head has just opened up a little bit more. Like the blinders have sort of peeled back a tiny bit. And I've realized that there's more, that it's more nuanced, that I have questions. The best thing I can hear from people at the end of an episode is, wow, I really have a lot of questions about this topic. I'm like, (laughs) that's great. Because when you started, you thought this was, you thought there was nothing more to learn about this. 
And now I have set you on a path to discovery. That's what this is all about, because that's where you're going to get to the place then where you won't be afraid to engage with this topic, where you're going to be willing to have conversations about it, where you're going to be open to the possibility that there are other views that you hadn't considered and that are outside of your own experience. That's that ultimately the real agenda here is to help people get better at at at, at those things, at that mindset so that they can do that in their daily lives, which is which is the new podcast that we're launching, actually, called Uncomfy, is stories of people doing that very thing in their daily life. That's what I've spoken to Eric about, making the decision to, to do the really scary thing and to stay vulnerable in that moment, to stay open, to stay curious instead of shut it down and run back to your safety bubble. It's amazing. And, and hearing you say that, one of the things, and this is going to be like a selfish plug, but Eric and I have talked about this a bunch on this podcast. One of our favorite compliments is when we ask a question and our guest looks at us and goes, well, I, I've never had that question before or thought yeah. about it that way. And, and I guess the biggest thing I tease out of that, though, is pushing it back on the consumer, right? So much right now is packaged of like, I'm selling you this. I'm teaching you this. This is your takeaway. And, and look, I get it. I build curriculum. I'm a trainer in one of my jobs. So the first thing I read is outcome. And and maybe that's part of why I critically look at so many things I see and, and consume. Because I'm like, this is to make me laugh. This is to make me angry. And then you make the decisions past that. And I I can't, now I just sound like I'm blowing smoke, but it, I think what you're doing is huge and so important because it needs to go back on the consumer of this stuff. Because it's like, hey, if it's just here to sell you an ad and it's pissing you off, shut it off. Yeah. Yeah. Shut it off. Yeah. Do it another way. Well, this is where, and that's where it all dovetails for me back to in, 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 in attempting to provide a better, more empathetic, empowered, optimistic experience, nuanced experience for the listener. I realized that there were actually some pretty simple behaviors that I could, that I could implement in my own consumption patterns <laughs> that, that could make me, that could also do all of this for me in my, like, that could, could give me these skills or that could strengthen this muscle, this curiosity muscle. And, and one of my favorites actually kind of ties back. Well, there's kind of, it sort of dovetails, but ties back to what I was asking you about. When was the last time you read an article from mm -hmm. top to bottom? It's very, very unusual. And you were even saying, Mark, that when it's a topic that you're not really interested in, then you, then, then you, you'll skim it. I mean, look, I spent seven years doing six interviews a day, in-depth conversations. Like I had to read a lot of material. I am a championship skimmer. And I got to the point where I realized that that was actually fueling a lot of my sense of overwhelm and depression because I was just broadly touching the surface. I wasn't getting to, I wasn't capturing the moments of surprise, the complexity. I was looking for the shortcuts and the good guys and the bad guys. And so one of the things that I do now very intentionally is when I'm consuming to consume because I want to be better informed about an issue, I will, instead of scrolling headlines, that was that some that was that used to be my way of like consuming the news was I'd go to a couple of different news websites and I would read all the headlines in the little one line summary nutshells or whatever they call them underneath every single one. And I'd like do that for the entire website. Now they don't even end the website. They just you, it's, it's just like an endless scroll. I noticed happened a couple of years ago. I'm like, this is just like being on my news feed. I could be on The Washington yeah. Post scrolling. People for four literally hours. pay to just fucking paste headline after headline. And it's that's I think like, that's what led me to the more skimmy habit. Cause I, yeah. I'm a pretty quick reader. So like my skim is still a pretty decent read. Yeah. And so I think some of that actually led me to be like, no, 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 no. So for me, yeah. just to clarify, if it's a subject I feel reasonably informed about and there's nothing new in it, I'm out. That's when I skim. Or if it's something that is so clearly trying to like push me in one direction to the other, I'm out. And I think it's one of the reasons why and people can make different decisions about bias, this or that. I think it's one of the reasons why I love The Economist and I love The Atlantic. And I think I'm going to love your podcast mm. is because it's genuinely often like, here are a lot of things. Here yeah. are some things I think. Here it's are some things this other person thinks. What do you think? And that's yeah, what yeah, I yeah. want to read. Yeah. <laughs> so here's what I've learned, though, is that, yes, you can go to some of these places and you can get like the whole package. Most of what of the information that's out there, though, is you're going to have to kind of consume it in bits and pieces. And so I so like you were saying, if you're going to pick a big controversial topic, try to consume it from multiple different way, points of view, multiple different cable channels, multiple different political biases. Right. Try to make sure you're not just getting all your news from one source. That's kind of like elementary. The next level is I try to 
um, for especially this is for people who tend to be avoiders because they're just like, it's overwhelming. It's too much. It's all bad news. I say, OK, well, don't skim. <laughs> because that's only going to make it worse. You're only just consuming the most upsetting stuff, which is the headlines. <laughs> that's it's just the it's just the stuff that's engineered to make you feel things. And and, yes. and so so don't do clicks, that. Clicks, 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 yes. clicks, clicks. It is like the, it's, it's so and it's not the whole story. Again, it's yeah, it, it's just engineered to get your attention and make you and make you feel big emotions. So instead of skimming, do a very quick skim, pick one article and then read it top to bottom, even if and notice Notice the point at which you're like, I know everything there is to know about this. This is boring. I'm going to stop reading. Notice that moment and keep reading. Notice when you're like, I really don't like this perspective or why are they quoting that lawmaker? Don't they know that he's a blah, 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 blah. Notice that and keep reading. And try to also notice what you find lower down in the article or you know, later on in the conversation if you're listening to it, because you will probably find that the stuff that start that makes you start to ask questions like, oh, but what about this? Or I never really thought about that. That's probably going to come later in the article because guess what? News journalists know that you have a short attention span generally, maybe not Mark, or maybe it depends on the topic, right? They know that you're skimming, Eric. Definitely they depends know... on the topic. Definitely <laughs> depends. It, it can they... be shorter than short or longer than yeah. long. <laughs> yeah. They know these things and we're trained to put the, put the most compelling, emotional, get a reaction stuff at the top. And then I have dealt with this on so many occasions where I feel like, gosh, this is a really complicated topic and I have to boil this down in a way that's going to be really digestible to somebody. But if they don't listen to the end of the episode, they're actually not going to get the full nuance. It's really mm -hmm. frustrating to me when people only listen to their first five minutes and they think they know what the show is about. And I'm like, no, you just touched the surface. And I really, obviously I failed to keep your attention, but, but it, some of it is on me as the consumer to also build up that muscle. So that's what I'm doing when I read a whole article. Instead of skimming for 20 minutes on various headlines, I'm going to, I'm going to skim, pick an article and read one all the way through. Now to level up, so this is like the third level. You really work your muscle. I won't just pick an article that I'm interested in. I will pick, I'll go to the opinion section and I will pick the opinion that I most disagree with on that day. And I will read it from top to bottom and notice how I feel. The whole mindfulness thing, right? I'm noticing, oh, look, I don't, I want to stop. Look, I'm, I'm like yelling. Look, I'm grimacing. Look, I'm thinking. And at every point when I want to stop because this is really bothering me, I will, I'll, I'll try to turn on my curiosity muscle and I'll think, I'll try to think of questions I would ask this person if they were sitting across from me. Well, I wonder about this. I wonder about that. Sometimes I'll ask the question and then they'll answer it as part of their article. What I'm really looking for is to try to understand how they came to hold this position. Sometimes it's just an article where they're spouting off some, a lot of rhetoric and I'm like, well, that was okay. Now I know their rhetoric, but most of the time, especially if it's not just a pundit, but it's like a Here's an ER doctor who's sharing their perspective. If they're not regularly in the paper, but they're, mm -hmm. they're someone who has written a, an opinion piece and it has been published in a reputable outlet, you're going to get some of their personal story and some of, the reason, some of the way they came to that perspective. And that, for me, is the best practice I could get for real life. Because if I can do that, then I'm going to be a little more equipped the next time someone at my family gathering says something that sets my emotions off. I, I can, I'll have better experience taking a few breaths and turning on my curiosity rather than trying to go straight into shutdown mode or lash out. So I'm not sure if this like doubly confirms how much of a weirdo I am, or it's the ocean between people who suffer from anxiety versus depression, which I've suffered from depression way more than anxiety, because what you just described is actually what I look for. If I start reading an article and it just echoes what I'm thinking, I'm like, that's a waste of my fucking time. Hmm. I actually often seek out the stuff that challenges me and pushes me. But then I'm in this like crazy quandary, exactly what you're doing. of like, oh, I want their perspective. I want this. I want that. And then it actually pushes me towards this like chasm of like understanding of like, OK, so I think this. They think that the truth is probably somewhere in between. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's this like yeah. I. So I wonder if if that's more of the difference or if I really I'm just weird, which is yeah. impossible. <laughs> well, those, Julie, are incredibly helpful tips, especially the last one. And I want to also kind of address Mark's piece, which I was just thinking through as he was talking about it and bringing it back to what how you 
originally started the conversation, Julie, around anxiety. And that's the world that I've always lived in. And so there's that ocean and the divide between anxiety and depression around controlling the uncontrollable, right? And so when it comes to anxiety, those of us like you and me who suffer from anxiety, we're always looking for something we can control. And I think our default is when we go into an echo chamber or when I, and I love her writing dearly, when I see Maureen Dowd's opinion column in the New York Times on Sunday, I gravitate right towards it. It is because there is that comfort. It's almost that safety and security that I'm looking for, that I know what she is writing about will bring me. So I'm curious yeah. your, your own thought and that depression versus anxiety split. Yeah, I the thing that I that I realized sort of my biggest takeaway was I, I realized after after trying to when as we were trying to create top of mind and I was trying to reformat my own sort of consumption habits, one of the things I realized that is that I had been doing a lot of skimming which was fueling the depression and overwhelm and the anxiety and the sort of like it was it was fuel, fueling the sense that there was too much out there and everything was terrible. I was skimming partly because I was afraid that if I, if I actually spent time to sit with that issue, to explore that issue, to kind of go more deeply, that I was afraid of what I might find out. I was afraid that I was going to find out that I was a lot less informed than I really was, than I thought mm -hmm. I was, that my position on the issue had caused harm to others. I was afraid, and, and this also kind of transitioned into being uh, well, I was also afraid to find out that it was hopeless, <laughs> even though I was already making the assumption that it was hopeless to begin with. So I like, I was like, I'm afraid I'm going to find out it's worse than I even think it is. And so I don't want to read this whole article about how the polar bears are dying, dying or whatever, right? And, and <laughs> hey, the so, polar bears are doing well right now, supposedly. <laughs> know, right? Supposedly, who so, knows? <laughs> so it was part part of I was afraid to engage deeply on topics, whether it was to read them, consume them in the news, or to even have conversations about them. In and to sort of like allow myself to become personally invested in them as more than just a journalist, but as a person in my community, I was afraid because if I started engaging, what if it turns out I can't win the argument? What if it turns out that things get heated? What if it turns out that I that I can't control the outcome here and that I don't really I can't see where this is going to lead if I decide to jump in? It just felt too scary, too, too much like this dark abyss that I was going to plunge myself into. And just like with mindfulness, I was I thought just like with all my other big emotions that it was going to suck me down into this whirlpool or whatever. And I'd never pull myself out of it. And it was kind of merging the, the recognition that I could engage. And if I could keep myself in curiosity mode and keep myself out of fight or flight mode and sort of be like recognize in a mindful way how things, how I was experiencing this, that I could actually get to a place of clarity or empathy or empowerment. So I was preventing myself from getting to those places because I was skimming and unwilling to kind of engage more deeply. I was afraid. I was too afraid that I couldn't control the outcome, that I wasn't willing to engage long enough to find out that I didn't have to control the outcome in order to feel empowered and to feel optimistic. Well, and it's amazing. And I think so much like in the mental health lens, we talk so much about response versus reaction, setting boundaries. And it's like, Everything you just described is essentially doing that for yourself with your relationship with the news, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. Eric, I'm sorry I jumped in. I know. I was just going to say to kind of just put a little perspective around it for our audience, because one of the things we always want them to recognize is, as you gave some incredibly helpful tips, Julie, there is a way to move through what you're experiencing, but also to know that they're not alone. And so I was just doing some quick math, <laughs> as I often like to do. And so I was listening to your 40% number. And mm -hmm. what I did is I thought to myself, okay, I'm going to break, I'm going to try to break this down a little bit more towards like where we are as a country. Right. And so about 80% of the country sits right. What, what we'd call kind of the middle, right? Most of the country is in that space and politically, the other 20, ideologically. politically and the other ideologically and the other 20% are on the extremes. And so that 20% we know for a fact is consuming in the echo chamber, probably not avoiding, and they're consuming probably heavier than anybody could imagine. So yes, if we take that right kind of 80% that. 
So 40% of that 80 puts us roughly 90, there's about 96 million people in the US. Pretty big number. Big number. Who are big number. news avoidant. This I'm going to leave as a cliffhanger because I don't know how to even begin to look at this from a scientific standpoint. But if we take, if we know that number is 96 million and we know that one in five people, so that's 20%. So we're talking about almost 65 million people are diagnosed with some type of mental health disorder, hmm. an extremely large number as well. There has to be a tremendous overlap in that Venn diagram between people who have been diagnosed with the, we'll call it the DSM-5, just for simplicity here, and those people who are news avoidant. And I will leave it to the people who have PhDs, not MBAs <laughs> next to their name, to figure out where that overlap lies. But I have to imagine it's a very large number. Yeah. I, I have to agree, but maybe that's because we're all sitting inside the Venn diagram. <laughs> What's really funny is, is like, I'm thinking about how to like tie up this episode and, and, and walk away. And we might have to talk again, Julie. There's so many more questions. But the thing I realize, I'm like, well, now I even wonder if I'm someone who would be qualified as news avoidant, right? So like in that sense of how I consume news with essentially what you've talked about, I realize I've kind of built those habits willy nilly on my on my own. Yeah, being very mindful of how I consume news, I wonder if that puts me in the category of news avoidant or someone who reads news. We don't have to answer that question now. But before we end, Julie, let's lay all those things out. Let's make sure people know how to find your podcast and the things that are coming next and anything else you want to share. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, there was a lot. Thank you guys for engaging with me. It was really fun to get this perspective. This was so fun. <laughs> I Okay. So Top of Mind with Julie Rose is the name of the podcast. This is our topic-based podcast where it's a 53-minute episode and each episode takes one tough topic and tries to give you all the stuff that we just described there. So you can find that on all the podcast platforms, YouTube, Apple, Spotify, wherever you're listening to this right now. It's in all those places. And coming in July, we're, la we're, we're launching a new conversation podcast that will be a weekly podcast called Uncomfy, Sticking with Moments that Challenge Us. And this is the one that Eric is going to be featured on, where people are t telling us one story. So we're going to break it down and we're going to learn from it together how to do this, how to stay curious, how to stay uncomfortable in in these moments when we're challenged by a viewpoint or we're out of our comfort zone, we're challenged in a way where we really want to shut it down because our threat response kicks into high gear. But we're really safe. It's not like the tiger is actually coming for us, but we're trained to feel that way when we're out of our comfort zone or when we encounter something we disagree with. So it's going to be a learn with us, get uncomfy, and let's practice. Let's learn what this looks like in daily life. So that'll be coming in July. It'll be called Uncomfy. And then you can just be in touch with us on social media and we'll be doing all of our announcements there. So it's Top of Mind Pod is our handle on all the platforms. Perfect. Well, and, and Eric and I have both been very forthcoming that we're not necessarily big podcast consumers. I'm excited to delve into Top of Mind. And, well, I'm excited uh, to hear what you think. You might have lots of criticism and I am open to it. <laughs> I want to be able to figure out how to serve more people with the podcast. Opportunities for improvement. Exactly. Constructive <laughs> Eric, criticism, whatever you want. Absolutely. I, I try to keep it that way, but I could be a little harsh and blunt is the feedback I've gotten. Eric, anything? <laughs> Julie, thank you so much for being on He's the show. He's laughing at me. I am. I am. It's been my I pleasure. I am laughing at him. Uh, what an amazing conversation. And truly what you are doing in the space with both Top of Mind and with Uncomfy, somewhere out there, Uncomfy, was, uh, it was so great being on that show. It's really, I'm going to use, I'm going to use a bold word. It's revolutionizing how people can consume news and information. And hopefully, as we all move forward, things will start to change and things will start to go more in the direction of how you're presenting the news and how you would like other people to consume the news. So thank you so much for all that you're doing. And yeah, I've listened to Top of Mind and it's great. It, it reminds me of when I was growing up as a kid and you would have a conversation at the dinner table or you'd listen in on the conversation that your parents were having. And it was just that. It was a conversation. And someone would throw out a question 
and it would start a dialogue. It wasn't all about just throwing out set viewpoints and trying to inflame and incite the room to try to get a big rise out of everybody. So thank you again. I know we'll be in touch and look forward to it. It's high price. Thanks to both of you. I cannot thank you enough. And Eric used one word and I'm going to use two. I really think your approach to news is desperately needed. And I will challenge anyone listening today or at any point to look within and understand how you're consuming and what you're consuming and how it changes how our mind works. And you've brought up all of the big touch points, but this impacts us. And it doesn't impact us only individually. It impacts us as a collective and how we engage. And that's listening to you, Julie, and then Eric's wrap up. I'm like, Thanksgiving dinner conversations don't have to be taboo. And it's one of the things Eric and I have worked so hard for in this space. And like, yeah, if you're depressed, anxious, not feeling good, tell people. If there's a new subject out there that comes up, imagine how much more freeing and healthy it would be to be able to have an informed and, and for lack of a better word, like civil conversation about it mm-hmm. that helps people and, 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 and the fact that matters is we're all in this together. Like this planet is us and we are this planet. And if we want to keep living and going, we're going to have to sort this shit out, people. So get on board is how I'll leave it. And Julie Rose, I cannot thank you enough for being such an amazing guest. So on behalf of my co-host, Eric DeRosa, and myself, Mark Fernandez, this is From Survivor the Thriver, episode 164. And I will leave us with these words, as I always do. Let's please all be as well as we can. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe to our show and leave us a review. Also, we'd love if you could share this episode with a friend and encourage you to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or email via the links in our show notes. See you next week.